Amen. We'll be seated, please. And let's, as we've just sung, let's ask God uh, again just for his presence uh, as we confess our need as we open the word together today. Lord, we do need you. We know that apart from you, God, we can do nothing. And apart from the work of your spirit, uh, God, we won't understand what it is that you have to say to us as your people. And so, Lord, we ask that today as we hear from you, God, that you would give us your spirit who illumines our minds and our hearts, who enables us to understand and to apply things that have been written and spoken centuries, even millennia ago. And yet, Lord, this word is timeless because it's yours. And so, Lord, we're here to sit underneath it and we say, oh God, that you have the words of eternal life. And that there is no other place, God, for us to go. So we pray that you would draw near to us in this time and speak truth to the very depths of who we are. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, really quickly, before we dive in, I just want to double-click on some of the things that Pam and, and Emily were up here talking about. We've mentioned in, on a number of occasions over the last few weeks this, this special Sunday in two weeks, May 19th, where we want to... Uh, send Emily uh, well. We want to give to her. I think I mentioned last week, you know, I hate math, but I mentioned last week that if every one of us committed to give 50 cents a day, we would more than cover Emily's one-time costs. That's if all 150 of us gave $150 uh, uh, on May 19th. If, if 75 of us gave $365, so $1 a day, we'd more than cover uh, Emily's needs. And I just, I want to encourage you, please prayerfully consider how God might want you uh, to, to be a part of sending Emily. This is something we've been praying for, that God would raise people up from our midst and send them. And now it's our responsibility and even privilege uh, to be able to partner with him uh, in the midst of that. So I just want to keep that in front of you. Well, a number of years ago, back when I was a, a college student in 98, uh, I actually went to Kiev, Ukraine for the first time. And Brooke and I, since, since that time, actually led a number of college trips over there. We would spend six, months at a t or six weeks at a time uh, in Kiev with a bunch of college students. And before we would go, every time, we would do some of the cultural training. Uh, even kind of like Emily was up here talking about a little while ago, where we would get to know a little bit of the history of the country and the city. We'd learn some of their customs. Um, like you don't, you don't actually give flowers to somebody in Kiev if you go for the first time, because usually you just give flowers when somebody dies. And so if you go and you take somebody flowers in Kiev, it's actually thought to be an offense. It's like, hey, I wish you were dead, you know. So you don't do that. You have to learn the different customs of, of the places that you're going. And when we would get on the ground there in Kiev, what we, the first thing that we would basically do, we'd have some kind of scavenger hunt so we could get the lay of the land. We'd learn the metro system. We'd, we'd go to the market, and we were encouraged to go and buy, you know, a kilo of rice and, you know, all these other things. And it's really hard because there's this language barrier, and there are all these things that you have to, you have to try to wrap your mind around in the midst of just trying to do these everyday tasks that you're trying to accomplish. And I'm convinced that in many respects, that is just like reading the Bible, any part of the Bible. Because when you open up the scriptures, it's like visiting a foreign country, isn't it? I mean, you, you open this book up, and essentially you're stepping back in time. You're stepping into a different culture, into a different context. And you have to learn a little bit about the history and the customs and the words and all of these different things. And when you open up a book like we're going to start studying now, the book of Zechariah, it's like going to a foreign country and going camping. Because then you're just in the wilderness, and you never know what you're going to get when you're in the wilderness, right? You're going to be faced, if you were in a different country, you'd probably see different animals, right? You might come across different vegetation. Can I eat that? I don't know if I can eat that. It looks like I can eat it, you know? But you have to figure those things out, and that's kind of what stepping back into any part of Scripture, but even the book of Zechariah is like. And you have to spend a little bit of time getting your bearings. But here's the good news. You can get your bearings. You, you can get your bearings 
on any part of the scripture that you're studying, even passages of scripture like Zechariah. And so when, when we open this up, you might actually be thinking, why in the world are we even looking at Zechariah, right? I mean, how many of you, be honest, how many of you within the last year have read the book of Zechariah? I see one, two, th- I see like three hands. Okay, that's honest. I love the honesty. I haven't. In the last year, I have not read Zechariah. This, this is like me going to a different country and going camping in some regards. But I want to I just outline some of the reasons why we're studying this and some of the things as we begin unpacking it, what we're going to see and learn along the way. And one of the reasons why we're doing this, we just finished, as many of you know, we just finished our series in the book of Matthew on the kingdom of God. And believe it or not, Zechariah plays into that theme of the kingdom of God in some really deep and profound ways. We'll see that as we go. But, but one of the questions that the people all throughout history have really been asking, we as human beings, deep down, we wrestle with this idea of the kingdom of God. We heard in Matthew, when Jesus came on the scene and he began preaching, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I read the news and I hear some of the things that Nathaniel just prayed about this morning, I think, really, the kingdom of God is at hand? It's in our midst? It's here? Really? It doesn't seem like it. Those kinds of questions are where the Bible and real life collide. And that's where Zechariah enters in. It's where all of the text of the scripture enters in because God is speaking to those needs in the very depths of who we are. And the people in Zechariah's day, and we're going to talk more about this as we go along today, they were wondering when the kingdom of God was going to be fully ushered in. They were longing for that. And so this book doesn't just inform us. It's not just information of this area or part of the Bible that we haven't explored before, though it is that. It's also for the sake of our encouragement and for our formation. It forms our minds and our hearts as we look into this. And there is, there is a human ache. It's in everybody that longs for a righteous government, longs for a good king, longs for good rule, isn't there? That's a human need. It's a desire. God's kingdom, God's glorious presence dwelling in and among his people. It's what we all long for. One of my professors once wrote this in his book, Renewal as a Way of Life. He said, When we read the Bible, the kingdom of God is the central theme which ties together everything in both the Old Testament and in the New. Now, listen to this. This is the important part. There is a reason for this. One of the ruling passions of humanity is the search for a righteous government. This search is the plot of the Old and New Testaments. Yet the Bible begins with man and woman rejecting the rule of God in order to exercise their own rule. And the effect of this revolt is to make human beings puppet kings, clinging to the illusion of independent control while actually enslaved by their own passions and by darker spiritual forces. Do you see that? Do you feel it? Because I think he's completely right. The bottom line is, we are all left asking, right? Where is the king? When's he coming? What's it going to look like when he gets here? Where's the kingdom of God? We're either asking that question or, as this says, we're trying to set up our own puppet kings, make our own fiefdoms, so to speak. And Zechariah is speaking into the midst of that. He's anticipating and describing the kingdom of God, God's glory in our midst. That's where we're going. That's our context. Now, I really want this to be fairly interactive today. 
So I'm going to ask you a few questions now, and I really want your responses. When you think of the book of Zechariah, what comes to mind? Are there any verses that jump out at you? Are there, like, what's going on when we, when we get out into the wilderness of Zechariah and we're, we set up our, our tents and we start camping? What comes to mind? Lampstands. There are some lampstands. We're going to talk about that. What else? Yeah, Susan? Okay. Okay, so Israelites, there's going to be allusions to the Israelites in the desert after they came out, to, out, out of Egypt. Anything else? Palm Sunday is mentioned. Yeah, Zechariah 9.9. We saw that a couple weeks ago. Yeah, Jesus riding in on a donkey. That, that reference is in the book of Zechariah. I'm not surprised that nobody's saying anything because, again, we usually don't frequent this part of the Scriptures, Right? Maybe you've heard that verse, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Does that ring a bell? Maybe you've seen it on a coffee mug or, you know, on a calendar, you know, in somebody's cubicle or something like that. That comes from Zechariah. That's Zechariah 4, 6. But I'll be honest, when, when I started jumping into Zechariah, that was all I had. It's like, I know it's in there somewhere. Where is it? And I had to look it up. Bible Gateway. Here we go, Right? But it's, it's really hard. So let me, let me just put up the first verse of Zechariah 1. And we're just going to look at the first six verses. So you can go ahead and turn there. We're going to spend some time just in this introduction. But I'm going to put the first verse up. And this, I think this is really going to clarify things for us. Okay? It's really going to make, historically, it's going to locate everything for us. So this is helpful. Ready? In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius... The word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo. You're all good now, right? Yep, I got it. Now I know exactly what part of of history we're in. I know exactly who this guy is. I know. You have to remember that when this book was written, when it was recorded, everybody that read it immediately would be like, oh, yeah, I know Edo. He's one of the priests. See, Zechariah is from a priestly family. That's important. Does anybody know who Darius or Darius is? I see a hand. He was a Persian emperor. That's right. It depends on what what lineage you look at, but he was either the second or maybe the third of the Persian Empire. Now, does anybody know why the Persian Empire is so important to Jewish history? Yeah, Susan. So God punished his people, actually sent him to Babylon first, and then Persia conquered Babylon. There are all these kings and kingdoms that are, it's like that game when you were a kid, you're trying to put your hand on top of the other guy, right? It was like that. It's always been like that. It's like that throughout human history, right? And so what happens is Persia comes in, and in Isaiah, Cyrus the Great is the first Persian emperor that we're introduced to anyway. He sends some people back to Jerusalem after they had been exiled. See, they were exiled in 586 to Babylon, and then they were brought back as early as about 539. And and, and some of these returns to Israel and Judah continue to happen. You can read the books of, of Ezra. Nehemiah, a couple of the other prophets talk about these realities of what would happen when people would go back. But the Persian kings were pretty smart. They only let the poor people go back. And so what happens when you start reading some of these books about these returns, everything takes place so slowly. The building of the walls under Nehemiah, the building of the temple under Haggai. These things take place slowly because the people have no money. They have no power. They have no authority. And so all of this is taking place in and around the time when Zechariah begins his ministry. And Zechariah's name, all right, you Hebrew studs, you just finished your final. Come on. Zakar. What's it mean? Anybody remember? Did you guys learn that one? It means the Lord remembers Yana Ostrowski in the house. That's awesome. Zakar. 
the Hebrew word for remembers. And then any form, when you come across a name in the Old Testament that ends in ah, it just means Yahweh. It's the short form of the Lord. The Lord remembers. Zakariah. Now, why would that name be so meaningful to a group of people who have just returned from exile? Do you ever feel like the Lord forgets? Do you ever feel like the Lord forgets you? Do you ever feel like the Lord forgets his promises? Man, maybe just in this first verse, Maybe just in this guy's name, we can find a little bit of encouragement. Because Zechariah is going to tell us over and over and over again, God has not forgotten. God still intends to pour out the fullness of his presence among his people. His kingdom is indeed going to come. He's trying to shape and encourage the hearts of God's people. So let's look at the rest of the text this morning. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore he said to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So that they repented and they said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and our deeds, so has he dealt with us. That's the introduction to the book of Zechariah. And for some literary context here, the first six chapters are, are really weird. They're all based on dreams, like your dreams, the weird ones that you have that you can't explain, right? That's what the first six chapters are. They're dream visions, and that's where we're going to spend the focus of our time as we're going through this, to remind us in, in these visions, Zechariah is being reminded of, again, God's faithfulness, God's desire to dwell among his people. And even in this opening text, we see that. God's desire to return, to be with his people. And what I just want us to think about today are two things as we orient to this idea, this larger theme of God's glorious presence in our midst. What would that look like? What would it take? How do we respond knowing that God wants to do this? What is God trying to teach us through all of this? The first thing is quite simply that God constantly calls us to turn. Maybe you heard that word repeat, return. Return to me. That word is used four times just in this text, but did you know if you do a word study, of the word shuv in Hebrew, you find 1,075 occurrences in the Old Testament. I looked at every one of them. I didn't. But there's one example in Deuteronomy 30 that we need to get our minds around. And, and let me ask you another question real quick just to set the context here. When you think about a prophet and what a prophet's job was, what was it? What did a prophet do? They prophesy. Thanks, Nathaniel. That was helpful. <laughs> What's a prophet do? Okay, they tell the people of their sin and to repent. What else? They, What's that? They minister to the people of God. They're mediators, okay? They share a message from God. And a lot of times, they have kind of a future bent to it, don't they? 
And a lot of, oftentimes, we might think about a prophet as like a fortune teller. But more of what you just said is what a prophet does. A prophet is like a, a prosecuting attorney in many respects. When you think about a prophet, that's what you need to think of. They are there to prosecute a covenant lawsuit. They're there to tell the people of their sins, to call them back to faithfulness to God. And so when you are reading the prophets, you need to also always keep in the back of your mind Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Now, how many of you have read that in the last year? Oh, a couple more. Nice. Deuteronomy 28 through 30 is very important. And we're going to look at part of that this morning around this word, turn. Listen to what God said. When all these things come upon you, what happens in Deuteronomy 28 through 30 is half the people of God are standing on one mountain and half on another. And this half says they shout across the valley at each other and they say, hey, if we disobey God, here's what's going to happen. And then this group of people says, yeah, but if we obey God, this is what's going to happen. And then it, it all kind of climaxes here in chapter 30. When all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call those things to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and you obey the, his voice and all that I command you with all your heart and all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have, your, and have mercy upon you. And he will gather you again from the peoples where he has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. God, in Zechariah's day, has just fulfilled part of this. He's bringing people back. They've repented. God, though, is still inviting his people to turn. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts. And God never tires of calling his people to turn, to return, to repent. We heard Jesus say that, right? When he came on the scene, when John the Baptist came on the scene, preaching and proclaiming, return, return to the Lord. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God never tires of inviting his people to turn. Now, to what had they turned? Idols, success, comfort, the ways of the nations around them. See, God does not want to be your theoretical savior and allow you to have a functional savior someplace else. God did not save you through mere words. He saved you through his one and only son. God is not a theoretical savior. He doesn't just speak. He puts into practice the realities that he's saying, and he expects the same from us. See, we can't say that God is our savior, but then put our hope and our desires, and our longings for fulfillment in other things. God is inviting us constantly to turn. All of those things in which you trust, in which I am tempted to trust, they will all fail us except the Lord. That's what God is saying. Return to me, to my ways, Practice, put into practice these things that you're saying. Repent, says the Lord. See, repentance, church, is a way of life. It's not an event. It's a posture of the heart. It's not a one-time deal. Repentance, if I sailed, Kevin, I would assume that repentance is like constantly staying at the wheel, making course corrections, because if I'm not mistaken, the waves and the wind would probably drive you off course. And the waves and the wind of this world, the world, the flesh, and the devil will constantly pull you off course. So turn, turn, reorient your heart, reorient your mind to the ways of God. That's what Zechariah is saying. He's inviting us into that place. We cannot, church, drift into closer proximity to Jesus. You can't coast 
into Christ's likeness. I love the way Oswald Sanders puts it. He says, think about this. We are at this moment as close to God as we really choose to be. Ouch. So what about my heart? What about your heart? Are we reorienting them to God? Are we currently turning toward Jesus or drifting from him? Turn to me. Return to me, God says. And this this reality was hoped for for God's people throughout the Old Testament. God constantly would call them to that. And they they knew their own hearts, and we're going to see more of this in a second. They knew their own hearts were prone to wander, as we sing sometimes. Prone to leave the God that we love. So, Lord, here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. That's what we sing. All of that comes from Deuteronomy 30. See, this was hoped for in the Old Testament. It's happened for us now through the work of Jesus. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul so that you will live. God has put his spirit within us, says Paul, using similar language in Colossians 2. God has circumcised us with a circumcision not made by human hands, but through the work of Christ and through the presence of his Holy Spirit. So our lives will continue to reorient to the ways of God. So that when God sends his sonar out, it bounces off the cavern of our heart. But we respond because his spirit is within us. Church, repentance is not, it is not evidence of hypocrisy. Repentance is evidence of authenticity. It's evidence of integrity. It's evidence of honesty before God regarding our sin. Hypocrisy is sinning and pretending that we didn't. Hypocrisy is being sinful and pretending like we aren't. So God is constantly calling us to turn to him. And that's good news. This constant invitation is good news, but we don't treat it as such, do we? We treat it like it cramps our style. When God convicts our hearts, we're like, man, flies in the face of my individualism, my autonomy, my attempt to make my own identity. We've been trying the whole find our own identity thing since the garden. It's not going very well. We have been made with an identity in the image of God. And he invites us through this call to repentance to be refashioned into his image. How many of you know of parents, by the way, who would ever say of their kids, yeah, I just let them play in the street because I don't want to be real hard on their autonomy. It's fine. I know they're only two, but yeah, he's sitting right out there in the middle of the road because I really respect their individualism. That wouldn't be loving. So God calls us to repentance again and again and again. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 25, 8. I remind myself of it every time I'm confessing my sins. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. You understand the one condition that's in that verse, Psalm 20, 25, 8, is that you have to be a sinner in order for God to be good to you. <laughs> That's good news. He's constantly inviting us to turn, and then finally, God faithfully teaches us to learn. God is faithful to teach his people. And he wants us to learn from other people's failures, not just our own. Learn from the mistakes of the other generations. Did you hear that in the text? I was so angry with your fathers. Don't be like them. Part of our, the the echoing of Hebrews, we used part of Hebrews for our, our assurance of pardon this morning, but the first three chapters of the book of Hebrews is essentially echoing this idea of, hey, if you hear God's heart, 
or if you hear God's word, his voice in your heart, don't harden your heart against him. Don't be like your forefathers who hardened their hearts. Be different. Learn from their mistakes. And see, so often today we think, well, I have to learn things personally. And sometimes you have to learn things through the school of hard knocks, right? You just have to learn things the hard way. And sometimes that is true. But isn't it great to be able to learn things the easy way? Actually through the mistakes of other people? And that's what God is inviting us into. And see, when we think, well, I have to learn things myself, I have to learn things the hard way, we're making two assumptions that I think are faulty there. First, we're assuming that we're actually going to learn when we go through something. And that doesn't always happen, does it? Everybody, anybody ever made the same mistake twice? Dang it, so have I, right? Maybe more than twice. So to say, well, no, I just have to disobey God on my own, and then I'll learn my lesson. No! That would be so dumb. And yet we do it all the time, right? But there's a second assumption that we make. The second assumption is that I can only learn from my mistakes. I've got to make them. I've got to do it personally. No, God is inviting us. He's saying here in this text, I'm constantly teaching you, learn. Learn from, learn from history. Winston Churchill once said in, a, in one of his speeches in 1948, he said, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. So true. Don't just learn from your mistakes. Learn from the mistakes of others. I love how Erwin McManus puts this. He says, if personal experience is the only filter from which real learning can come, then what of the wealth of learning that's available through the composite history of all humanity? Is there anything to be gained by listening to others? It should be obvious that those who live enlightened lives have demonstrated a unique ability to learn from everyone and everything around them. This is characteristic of an essential component of living wisely. Now listen to this. When you are your own reference point, you destine yourself to an endless cycle of foolishness. Ever been there? Experience is no guarantee of enlightenment. And if you're learning everything the hard way, you might want to ask yourself if it's possible that you're hardly learning. Ouch. Brother dropping truth right there. God is constantly teaching us even through the faults of others. Now, we learn primarily something about God and something about us here. Really quickly, we learn that God is sovereign. Did you hear how many times Lord of hosts repeated there? Five times in six verses if you weren't counting. Lord of hosts, it's built on God defending, coming to the aid of his people in Exodus 15, verse 3. God is the first warrior. And listen, as the Lord of hosts, he will either fight for you or he will fight against you. But God is inviting us to learn of his sovereignty here because he's the Lord of hosts. And it would be important for a post-exilic people just returning back to their land thinking that they're about to get taken over again. It would be important for them to know that the Lord of hosts is on their side. It would be important for them to remember that God is sovereign. It would be important for them to know that God is faithful. And that's the second thing that we learn here. God is not just sovereign as the Lord of hosts. He's faithful. He keeps his promises and he has just kept his promises to discipline his people when they disobey. The questions in verses 5 and 6 are painful, but God is just trying to get us to learn. Hey, your fathers, where are they? You know the answer to that, right? They died while they were in exile. Do you remember why? Because I told you, that if you disobeyed me, if you sought after the things of the nations, I would take you to the nations. So stop it. God is trying to teach us that he's faithful. He says, my blessings or my curses will overtake you. My word has overtaken you. See, 
You can rebel for as long as you want from God, but listen, here is a promise. You ready? God's word is, out gonna, is gonna outlast your rebellion. Isaiah 40, verses six and seven says, we are like grass. We're here today, gone tomorrow. God's word is at some point going to overtake your rebellion, period. So he's inviting us to turn and he's, he's teaching us to learn that he's faithful. And then finally, that God is gracious. God is sending warnings ahead of time during our rebellion. God's message here is clear through all of the scriptures. This is a message of mercy and compassion. Return to me. Return to me. Return to me. Second Chronicles tells the story of the, the final fall of God's people. And in 2 Chronicles 36, the very last chapter, verse 15, listen to what God says. The Lord, the God of your fathers, sent persistently to you by his messengers. Why? Because he had compassion on his people in his dwelling place. We learn that God is gracious and we learn of our desperate need. If God does not do something, we will not turn back to him. And so God comes after us and he sent his son and he has sent his spirit to reorient our hearts to the fullness of who he is. Are we asking God like the psalmist, Lord, incline my heart to your words? and not towards selfish gain. Lord, illumine my eyes, illumine my heart, oh God, that I would walk in your ways. We learn about God, we learn about ourselves, and finally, one more thing we learn about God is his desire. God's ultimate desire, church, is to dwell with his people. Return to me, and I will return to you. See, God delights to be present among the repentant. That's where God likes to dwell. God delights to be present among the repentant. God's desire from the beginning of history is to dwell with his people, is to reign over his kingdom in the midst of his people. Start in Genesis. What in Genesis do you see, church? that demonstrates the fact that God wants to dwell with his people. What do you see? His visiting in the garden, his walking in the cool of the day, right, with his people. What in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy do you see that demonstrates the fact that God wants to dwell with his people? He brings them back even after they fail. A tabernacle is set up even in their midst so that God can dwell right there. Then on into the days of the kings, a temple is set up that demonstrates God's willingness to dwell with his people. In the New Testament, what do you see that demonstrates God's desire to dwell with his people? John 1.14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Paul goes on, Peter goes on, James goes on to talk about the spirit of God filling the hearts of his people so that God can dwell with his people. Church, God is doing it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, but it's not done yet. We're still longing for the fullness of its consummation. But if you want more of God, he's inviting us to a place of deeper humility, deeper repentance, constant turning, constant learning. Because God delights to be present among the repentant. But what about us? Lord Jesus, we recognize that you invite us to that place. God, that you usher us in through your spirit to a place of admitting our need for you, 
And God, we pray that you would prevail upon our hearts. Lord, we need you. As we have already sung this morning, we need you, O oh God. You are our holiness. You are our righteousness. So God, even in this day, even in these times, reorient our hearts to you. Allow us to learn of your sovereignty and of your faithfulness and of your grace and of your deep desire to be with us as your people. We thank you in Jesus' name.